chicken or the egg? This is a question that has plagued scientists and philosophers for like centuries. Why? Because understanding this question is going to bring you enlightenment and bragging rights over like the guy you're arguing with. But soon, in the very near future, I think that question, that ancient conundrum is going to be changed to a new question, which came first, the video game or the book? All right? Because video games used to be nothing more than abstract pixels depicting triangles shooting pixels at one another. Then at some point, the human need to find meaning and context breed life into those pixels. Pac-Man got a mouth, therefore he's hungry. He's got a personality. Jumpman had a princess that needed to rescue from a big giant ape that's kept, you know, that is a uh, big giant ape that doesn't appreciate or understand the princess the way you think you do because you listen to Taylor Swift. All right, and then soon games like Ninja Gaiden, cutscenes, cutscenes, people. We, got, we love cutscenes. I think if you were here earlier today, we had a whole pe someone talking about an entire department, you know, making cutscenes. So, with this increased focus in narrative in games, it only makes sense that games have now become a fully fledged storytelling medium. Putting them on the same stage as books, graphic novels, basically classic stories bound in that really nice smelling old paper kind of vibe. So, and now that they're side by side, it makes sense that stories are now jumping from one medium to another, or what these industry folks are going to call transmedia adaptation. So my name is Drew Pan. Normally, I'm an indie game developer, and sometimes in, you know, on my day job, and, and I'm in an advertising suit. So no soul, that's OK. But today, I'm going to be moderating this panel of really, really awesome people who are going to be telling us all about transmedia adaptation. And by moderating, I'm pretty much just going to sit here in this chair, keep it warm. They're going to do all the talking. OK, they're going to throw you with their wisdom. So stay a while and listen. And you'll, listen, and you'll learn all the different strengths of the different mediums in storytelling and how to identify good opportunities for adaptation, maybe the intricacies of adapting stories. And uh, at the end of this talk, at the end of the honor speaking, I'll check in with you guys again. So if you have questions, there will be a time for you to address these fine storytellers here. And if you're too shy, later on, after the talk, you can go over there where um, you can get some like, you know, coffee or snacks or whatever and ask these esteemed storytellers. Food and drink sponsored by the French Embassy. So without further ado, let's go and talk about who these amazing storytellers are. Uh, okay, hi guys. So uh, my name is Ian Fan. Uh, I'm working for Area 28 uh, Technologies. Um, we are currently working on games in the uh, Web3 space as well as helping other games develop uh, some stuff for Web2. So um, I have a bit of background. I graduated in a BA in literature and wondering how we're going to survive. I ended up writing for games. Uh, I ended up working at Ubisoft, uh, doing Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Valhalla. Um, as well as a little indie game before that called Holy Potatoes, where in space it's really cute, it's about space potatoes. And it's all punny, it's really funny. Um, so that's kind of my, my background in this. Uh, what I do right now in my current job, um, the transmedia aspect of it, sometimes our clients will say, um, we want to eventually um, break out into stuff like, you know, movies and films and stuff like that. So how do we position that ourselves from the start with certain game narratives? So that's kind of the things that we kind of talk to them about and try and solve. Um, uh, for that, that's my kind of like uh, experience towards this transmedia um, part of this talk anyway. So I'll pass it on to Etienne. Uh, can't think you click that button. Oops. Whoa, spoiled the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> well, thanks, Ian. I'm very happy to have a, a former colleague here. <laughs> nice to my side. We speak the same language. So I'm from Ubisoft. Uh, I'm senior transmedia content manager at Ubisoft. Uh, well, which makes it a good position to talk about transmedia. Uh, Ubisoft, as you probably all know, is one of the biggest video game studios uh, in the world with uh, massive franchises such as Assassin's Creed, obviously, Far Cry, Watch Dogs, Splinter Cell, Ghost Recon, lots of them. Uh, 
And what all these franchises have in common is great stories. My job is to try to bring those stories on different medias by finding proper partners to do that and helping them deliver on great stories with great creative teams. Uh, within the transmedia department with my colleagues, we work on books, traditional publishing, from novels to mangas, graphic novels, comic books. We have uh, an important focus on audio content too, podcasts, audio drama, audio books. Digital fiction is at the core of our activities and it's growing year after year, especially with the webtoon phenomenon. And finally, we also cover narrative board games, tabletop RPGs, mystery games, that kind of stuff. Um, so as you can see, we do that on all of our franchises. It's uh, our objective really to expand our brand territories across as many cultural industries as possible. And uh, we, of course, rely on our games first. Here's a quick example of what we did with one of our fine favorite characters, Xiao Jun from Assassin's Creed Chronicles China. On this character, we were able to develop a series of novels written by a Chinese writer, mangas, shonen mangas, developed with a Japanese publisher and, of course, a Japanese mangaka, uh, and an enhanced audiobook with Shimalaya in China with uh, a world-class uh, actress, voice actressing uh, for Xiao Jun. We are lucky to work with talents from all over the world, and that's why I'm very happy to be here today because looking forward to meet new creative talents. Whatever the industry, again, what we are trying to do is to create new stories on our franchises, and we are very open to work with new various talents. And leaving the mic to... Thank you very much, Etienne. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Wayne. Uh, I am the co-creator of this book right here, Work-Life Balance, Malevolent Managers and Folkloric Freelancers. Yeah, I said the full, full title. Um, I co-created this book with uh, my partner, the comic creator, Benjamin Chi. Um, I'm usually doing stuff like pro short stories and stuff like that. Ben obviously um, works in comics. Uh, so what we wanted to do was we wanted to kind of tell one big story, um, which is what it's like to work for a multinational corporation that's run by literal demons. This is not in any way based on any company that I've worked for before. I swear. Um, so what we wanted to do is tell this huge story and we wanted to interweave between the two mediums that Ben and I work in. So, you know, there's a little bit of prose, but then it interweaves into comics as well. So we were kind of doing a kind of a version of a transmedia thing within the book itself. So our publisher, Difference Engine, said, you guys want to make games as well? Um, and I said yes for two reasons. One, I'm too gung-ho for my own good. And two, I thought to myself, ooh, writing games, that would be an interesting challenge. How difficult could it be? And then I found out. Um, so we teamed up with the wonderful guys from Lionfish Studios at Imba Interactive, and we came up with the game Internal Damnation, Pick Your Hell. Um, as the title implies, you're working as an intern for the Demonic Corporation. So, you know, you, it's a text-based game, and you'll be doing regular stuff like getting coffee for your boss and everything. Um, but while you're getting coffee for your boss, you're trying not to get um, eviscerated or killed by a stray fireball somewhere. Um, yeah, and, you know, I also was from Advertising Drew, so that's my call to action slide. Sybil? Thanks. Um, does it work? It does not move. No! It goes back. It goes back. I'm going back. Oh no! What is happening? <laughs> Wait. No? Help! I am bad with technology. <laughs> and I work in video games. Um, help? <laughs> oh, I can mime the slides. Uh, hey! <laughs> Yes, thanks. Uh, so I'm Sibyl Collas, I'm a narrative designer and writer. Uh, my specialties are initially in video games, but I also work in transmedia. I am, I am the, the middle guy. I'm the person like, that goes between video games and authors, usually. Uh, I'm a freelancer. I don't have a set company. I started as a producer, and I've worked with like, quite a number of clients. Uh, I'm mostly a game and narrative designer, as in I focus on mechanics and the way to 
bring a narrative to a medium, whether interactive or not. Uh, I'm also a writer for science fiction, fantastic and fantasy, and a script doctor. I've worked on interactive series, for instance, and a lot of advertising. And I'm also a diversity, um, equity, inclusion specialist uh, for mostly queer and autistic um, problematics. So some of the clients I've worked with, it's like way more than that, but these are the names that people usually recognize. Um, so Arte, Ubisoft, CineTV, Don't Nod, uh, I've worked, I think Don't Nod is probably the client I've worked the most with. We are social in one advertising, Warner Bros in interactive TV, Studio BK, and we are social for uh, advertising. Dus Dizem is an indie studio. I do some indie production, but it's mostly AA to AAA studios. Some of the brands you might recognize, uh, so the top is a video game, so Vampire with Don't Nod, which was a big time RPG. Uh, Anno with Ubisoft, uh, Twin Mirror with Don't Nod as well. I've also worked with luxury brands like Audemars Piguet, the, the, like, the watches, <laughs> which was a fun project, uh, Renault, the cars, uh, Secret Story, which is basically reality TV in France, like Big Brother. Um, Shady part of me I put because it's, it's a very small title and I assume that most of you never heard of it. Uh, it's a French indie game and I love it because I wrote it in two months. And don't do that. <laughs> ever. Like, no. <laughs> I basically had like, I think three days to edit the whole thing. Um, and Aya, uh, Aya is a transmedia title, kind of, in the way the processes were set up, in the way it was written. It's an advertising project initially, and it ended up as an entertainment center that is set to open in Dubai uh, in this fall. So it's a um, space that is 40,000 square feet uh, for the entire space. It's going to be in the Mall of Water City. I've done several more projects, I don't really know why, but it just so happens that I did. Uh, so it's usually spaces that will mix digital with writing that is going to be both traditional prose and interactive storytelling in the way of narrative design for video games. Do I still use this thing? <laughs> it's yours now. <laughs> awesome sauce. All right, now that we've met the speakers, let's, uh, let's go straight, straight in. Okay, first question. I would like to direct this towards Etienne, okay? Because as the senior transmedia content manager at Ubisoft, one breath. Okay. Um, so tell, can you tell us a bit more about like the different mediums and maybe like what, what are their strengths, you know, in storytelling? All right. So as you saw, we try to cover as many mediums as possible. Um, I think I, I always like to say it all starts with stories and um, what makes it very interesting is that uh, we have rich universes in the video game industry. Universes, especially at Ubisoft with, you know, the open world. Um, lots of characters, lots of potential for side stories, backstories, sequel. So, video games, in what I do, open a world of opportunities for telling other stories on other mediums. And that's probably what makes it so easy to cover uh, formats as different, again, as a manga series, which will require a lot of story uh, to tell, um, a novel, which is also quite deep in terms of storytelling potential, but also shorter formats like uh, a comic, for example. Um, and that's only to talk about fiction, because we have also a whole a range of non-fiction content and somehow it builds upon those worlds too. So, yeah, video games is like um, a well in which we take creative material, we bring it to creators who are experts on their specific medium. We worked with uh, worldwide famous novelists, illustrators, and um, that's what makes it so interesting, I guess. Um, Sybil, because you've, from a, from a writer's perspective, all right, what are like the benefits, like, you know, like, of like, both of these mediums, you know, like, what? From a writer's perspective, um, 
It really depends on what you'd like to do in terms of narration, because you can find something in novels that is going to be very linear and directive for the user, the reader, so to say. Uh, but in different formats, specifically video games, you have a creation of empathy that is so much deeper uh, than you can have in books. It really also depends on the users, because some users will play a video game, but they are not used to the medium, and they won't like understand the codes of it. Um, but usually, when you have a video game environment, you will look for specific anchors that are missing information through, through environmental storytelling, partial dialogues, content writing that is going to be the lore books that you find in the thing, that are going to be a, like a trail of crumbs that players are fed, and the links they build between these crumbs are a huge vector of empathy, and it is very specific to video games. So as a writer, it's interesting because you have to master other disciplines, so to say, you have to learn about art, you have to learn about sound. The ecosystem of video games is not just mechanics and like the cutscenes. What's really interesting is what, what happens in between. So you have to learn about all things system, all things that is art, and not just visuals. Sound is like extremely important. And writing about sound is like a huge challenge, but so satisfying. It's not something you can do in books. Uh, you can have that in series, in movies as well, but it's a different kind of language because music is not treated in the same linear, fixed-in-time way. So you have that whole wide array of tools that you can use that are so new and so powerful. Does that like make it more difficult? Yep. You know? <laughs> Do you sometimes want to tell a more linear story? Oh, I burn out. <laughs> okay. But it's so fun. Mm -hmm. It's really so fun. Like the, the, so I think we've all had experiences where we looked at something and we're like, there's no way I can tell a story with all of that. Like, just give me a slice and I will focus on that slice and it's fine. <laughs> like, I will give you a vertical. Like, that's all I can do now. So usually it's teams. It's rare on like, at least a double A game that you're alone. Uh, it's kind of the myth of the author in video games that does not really exist in the reality of the industry. You have to have minions, or to be the minion of someone, or to be a team of minions with no overload. Uh, but yeah, yeah it's, it's a struggle, but a fun one. It's a good one. Like The satisfaction of having a narration that is actually understood that by the players is everlasting. If you look at titles like we were discussing Disco Elysium, or titles that, uh, that are fundamentally narrative, like the Telltale's game, for instance, there are titles that are very dear to the players and are so fundamental, even to us as creators, as an industry, they leave an impact on you that is going to be seen through all of your future creations. I think to kind of go off that point, um, we're talking about, you know, as, as a reader or whatever, you're a passive audience, you're entirely passive. You sit there, you know, and you just absorb what's happened. So, for example, I mean, that's this like psychological experiment, right? Like if, if every time you press a button, someone dies, right? So if you're watching a movie and a character presses a button, and all right, well, yeah, you press the button, right? I don't feel bad. But then if I give you a controller, and now I say, press X, you suddenly feel a whole different range of emotions. They go like, oh man, uh, what do I do, right? And you have no, maybe you have a choice, maybe you don't have a choice. Um, even if you don't have a choice, then some people argue them why I have the choice. I like, know because I want you to feel things, right? So, and I think this is only achievable in, in, in the medium that is games. There's no other, no other medium that you can achieve uh, with, with that. Um, so, yeah, just, just to go off that point, yeah. Yeah, the agency of it. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think we're, we're all geeks here, right? So I think a lot of us would have played Dungeons and Dragons at some point. I remember being like a dungeon master and just like, guys, 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 just do what I want you to do. That's not the story. I guess that's also what, what makes transmedia adaptation very interesting. If you come from games which gives player this agency, then a transmedia product gives you the specific vision of an artist about that game with his own set of ethics, for example, or the very own personal themes that resonate with them, whereas video games have the agency and are the product of a collective uh, creative process. So, you know, it also gives you a different perspective on the universe. That's something quite rich, I think. I think another... Oh, sorry. No, my big takeaway was we're supposed to have minions. I didn't get any minions. It does happen, yes, oh, that no. you do have minions. That, that you just started, so it's going to come. That's true. <laughs> it's okay. going to come. Okay, okay. That explains so much. 
<laughs> sorry. I kind of forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, uh, oh, come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Um, Wayne, yeah. so you're, you, you went from writing a graphic novel, and suddenly they said, hey, make, a, make an interactive game out of it. Tell us more about that, because I, I, I think, you know, you said it was a little bit kind of like, you know, you felt like you're biting a bit more than you can chew, and it, it, things got anxiety kicked in. Um, yeah, so that was, that was fun. Um, no, I, when, when Defense Engine actually approached me about writing the game, I, that, I, that really was my, my initial instinct was like, oh, this is going to be an interesting challenge, because I've worked in prose, I've worked in comics, I've worked in film, and I've worked in even like audio podcasts. So I'm always kind of interested to see how your story works in specific mediums and how you can play through those medium strengths. And I assumed it was going to be a similar enough challenge where, yeah, every medium is going to be different and you have to play through those strengths, but, you know, storytelling is essentially storytelling. While storytelling is essentially storytelling, even in games, the challenge for writing games, and this is just a text-based game, no less, um, but the challenge for writing games was so much more than I could predict, so much more than I could imagine. Um, I, I sit here and I look like uh, like I was frightened. It was really fun. It was it was a bit stressful for somebody who's never written games before. And I was like, oh, okay, I can go there, but I, I can go, to, oh, oh, oh no, oh no. I've got so many different paths now. Um, it was interesting and it was, I think, it, for somebody who's so used to a very linear story, it was incredibly fun for me. I can say that now because I've written the game already, so I'm like, yeah, uh, retrospect and everything. But looking back on it now, it's definitely something that for somebody who's never written games before, it's something I want to keep doing. It's something I want to try again and again and again because it's so vastly different from anything else I've written before and so fun. Can you share any like the... Did you do anything to prep? Because like you, you said you're going from one medium, which yeah. is completely linear, to like, you know, branching stories yeah. and, and player agency. Um, well, playing games was a bit of a prep, um, but that, that's a bit of a cop-out. Uh, no, what I... Because I, I figured there was going to be enough branching uh, um, narratives out here that what I did was I made sure that, okay, I have enough... I, I think the program I used was Twine or Twinery or something like that. And so I made sure that I had enough progress. I, I see a lot of nodding going around me. Yeah, we nod. <laughs> you, it's great, isn't it? Um, yeah, Th that was a massive help. So I had that to keep myself sane and look at it and go, okay, I see the big picture and all that. I think we were discussing this a little bit earlier during lunch as well, where one thing that really took me by surprise was when you go off into these different bunches, it's for a linear story, it's very easy to keep track of the character or the player's motivations, but with games, you have to think about, okay, this is who the character is, this is who you're playing as, but how would they react to these very different situations? It's no longer linear, um, you know, do, 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 their motivations don't change, but how do they change based on the choices they make as well? So I think, it, to go back to answer your question, um, yeah, playing games is one thing, but the, the main preparation was finding out about Twine. Twinery? Twine? Twine. 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 Yeah, oh we've, all, we've all played with Twine. Like, oh my god, huge help. Massive help. Yeah. It's, it's fun too because you actually, as a writer, I find, give more flesh to the characters. Yes. Because you explore the story in ways you could not do in a linear manner. So you actually have that mass of, like, you have your red thread, you have your perfect story, you have moments of acts or whatever structure you chose to build your story, but you actually have to go into finer details that are secondary, tertiary, that are built around that core that you would never explore in any other format. And the, it's an amount of work that is insane, but it also allows you to express as a writer things that, if you were writing a book, you would have to cut. Uh, you would still cut them if they're bad, Sometimes you keep them because you need like to, to, to ship a certain amount of content, but still. Yeah. <laughs> but it really is something very interesting as a writer because you go deeper into the initial uh, threads of your story. Yeah, no, definitely. I, uh, to be fair, sometimes you keep them because you're stubborn and you want some things in there as well. Um, but that was, that was such, I think that's probably why I want to write 
more games as well. Because it's exactly that. Like, the character was so... F- and it's a, the character that we created was like a nameless character so that anybody could play the game and they could fit into it. Uh, but it felt... For a nameless character, it felt more... It felt just as alive as every other character that we created in the book. It felt... It felt more... It, just as full as every character we created in the book. Um, which was definitely something I didn't expect as well. Yeah. I, I remember what I was going to say, and it's Paisley Perfect. Yes, so okay. When we, when we worked on uh, Assassin's Creed Oz, we were told that there's player choice, but so is the player role-playing as the character means I get to do whatever I want, and the answer was no. So we were told to play within the confines of re- the constructed character. This character probably wouldn't, you know, uh, give money to help someone for some reason, right? One is another. But so we had to decide that, okay, the options and the choices had to be polar opposites, or, but still within the realm of possibility of what this character would do, which is a far cry from, you know, like creating a crack uh, avatar and wow and doing whatever I want. Yeah. So, like having a nameless character, you know, it, 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 you identify with it more because it's you, but sometimes when we had, in a sense, we have a named character mm. who has like kin and, and all that stuff, then the changes come a bit different, the writing yeah. comes a bit different. Uh, another thing to talk about when we, we talked about, uh, you know, all, you put all these points where it's perfect, you have the tension, and then you're playing an open world game and you're going to go and fight the last one. It's like, oh, sheep side quest. <laughs> and you're like, eh, and you can't control the player. So how do you maintain that kind of uh, emotional state? You have to keep in mind the emotional state of the player, where they are, what they're going to do. Uh, is the sheep quest fine? Should we cut it for now while you're in this? You know, there's a lot more going into that story. So when you think about bringing that into a, uh, you know, like a film or something, it's easy. You cut the cut the, cut, cut the sheep quest, right? So like, we need to play, pick out what is the story you're actually trying to tell, or the things that's very about. Like with all the Disco Elysium, uh, it's about the world because there's so many ways to consume that story. But the thing that really binds it all together is the grim, dark, you know, just post-apocalyptic feel of, a, of of people trying to survive. And that is to me, if we were to make a film out of it, I would say, yeah, let's have a totally different character, but in this world, you know. That's, uh, you know, when you build, you can build transmedia uh, storytelling on a game that has almost no storytelling. We do that uh, at Ubisoft. We did that with uh, the rabbits, for example. These characters were just like funny pets with no story. They were creatures from a party game. And we were able to build a TV series, uh, a manga, a shonen manga, adventure in the fantasy world. So, yeah. The, the world definitely comes first, and then when you have a world, you know who inhabits the world and what the, what state the world is in. That therefore, what objectives these people have to survive, to make money, like us or like whatever it is, right? Yeah, you just need the ingredients, and then you can you can bake whatever you want. Sometimes it's just not the world itself, but the fantasy of it, like the pillars of it, uh, like for instance, cyberpunk or even arcane, the work they did going from League of Legends and going from Cyberpunk like 2077, they took essences of the world, not the entirety of it, uh, to give you a feeling of it. And it's really important to boil down your story to the points you want to tackle. Sometimes it can be about the world around a specific character that is going to be your anchor, or the world as in the lore, the wide stage on which the game is set. Uh, if you go from game to another thing. Uh, and when you go the other way around, it's interesting because you still have to identify these pillars. Is it going to be character world? Is it going to be character centric? Is it going to be the entire world itself? And it's many different lenses through which you can look at your medium. And actually, for each of these, you can do a different transmedia. Like, one book is never going to get the one video game, and we cannot do anything else. Different genres, different stories. And it's really interesting, because every time you touch the matter with these different tools, you will have something extremely varied in terms of results, extremely challenging in terms of writing, because the more you build these things, and I think you're very aware of it, that it becomes a monster that you have to keep track of. And it's, no, (laughs) I could not do your job. (laughs) I barely hold myself on one eyepiece, and no. Uh, But it's insane in the way you build these, like, tentacle monsters of lore and character and authorial intent. Because even if it's many writers working on, on it, there is still that vision of an author wanting to build something specific in this world. And it's really that kind of matter that we're touching upon with the very notion of transmedia, I believe. 
it's, it's really a balanced act to give agency to the writer who's, uh, I don't know, writing the Assassin's Creed young adult novel, because there's this set of pillars, as you just said, for the blonde, but there are also the constraints that are essential to the medium and to the audience we are addressing. Because I think one, one point that we haven't really addressed yet is also that of the audience. When you touch upon transmedia, it allows you to reach to sometimes a different audience uh, in terms of uh, age range, for example. Again, we developed uh, young adult content based on Assassin's Creed, which is quite a violent game, quite a mature game at first. Um, so but, um, that's something that Transmedia allows you to do, and uh, it can be a challenge for the writers, for sure, definitely. And so finding the, the perfect agency between respect for the original world, use of its pillars, its ingredients, but also freedom of writing, um, is sometimes challenging. But at the end of the day, I think the objective needs to be to produce an enticing content for the audience that you target specifically with that media. It can also have something to do with uh, culture. For example, we develop lots of, uh, I'm again talking about Assassin's Creed because it's our biggest franchise in terms of transmedia, but uh, we develop lots of original Chinese content because we know that uh, it is important in literature, for example, for Chinese readers to be able to culturally relate to the content. So in order for us to achieve that, we work a lot and very closely with uh, Chinese novelists, for example. So it's, it's really a matter of um, having your audience in mind and give the writer the proper agency. Quite a challenge, <laughs> true. I think that they've come a long way, right? Like 10 years ago, if you say that, oh, your favorite video game is going to come a movie, you're like, oh, God, no. <laughs> like, a Warcraft movie sucked. Sorry, no, it did I, not. I, I, come I, on. I, I played WoW for 15 years, guys. It was terrible. It wasn't and, that bad. And you have, like, you, okay, we won't mention some movies, but, like, um, there's just a bunch of other movies where you go, like, this is, what is this? And it's because when you pitch the thing at Hollywood Girls, like, we know best, we know how to make films, let us write it. But they have, no, they have no idea who they're writing for, you know? And then now it's better. You look at Arcade, they just won an Emmy, a well-deserved Emmy. And the team was so, they're like, these are the core tenets of what we need to do. It's the relation of these two characters who are focusing on. These are the worlds you can have little tidbits of information of other countries that are going to come out in the future and thing. And as, as someone who used to love League, but you, 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 you hate playing the game after a while, but you still want to be involved in law, right? I think that's the main reason why Transmedia exists because for example, games like um, Pokemon, maybe you just don't like the game, but you, you kind of like the anime as a kid, right? Or you, you didn't get to play the game. Or you like League, but you load in the game of League and you die in 30 seconds, and then people call you trash. And uh, how can I enjoy it? But I love the characters, I'm going to do it, and this is the best way to do it. And I think it's come a long way, and I think the past decade, in, in them realizing that, you know what, I think the, the people who write the game actually know how to write stories. Yeah. That's pr but the, the fact that it's working better and better has probably something to do also with the fact that the producing teams of the games are much more sensitive to transmedia uh, today. And uh, what we try to do, at least at Ubisoft, it, it, is to think of transmedia as something really collaborative. And uh, along the writing process, we involve the narrative teams from the games, for example, of, for some big brands, we have dedicated transmedia teams helping us really coordinate the development of the graphic novels, for example, with uh, the creative director from that game, with the narrative writer of that specific mission in which that specific character exists. So. I think it's uh, really, the success of it really depends on the collaborative process behind it. And it's not always easy because you have to coordinate industries which have different timings, different working cultures. So not always easy, but uh, that's why in-betweeners, just like you, on I, are there. Different processes as well. I think you're the one who suffered the most from it. <laughs> uh, but yeah. it's like, no, it, it's not just a matter of developers learning about books or any other medium, or the author of a linear medium having to learn about video games. You both have to like 
really know how it's done. Uh, you cannot just give a script to a video game developer and hope for it to come out all right, uh, because then you're going to see the mechanics and it's either just going to be, I'm clicking through text. Hmm, I'm having fun. This is nice. Or it's going to become something widely different from everything you imagined. Uh, is the thing you talked about, like play games, you, you said it was a joke, but please do be like, have some kind of an agency as well as an author. No, it's just not about player agency, it's about author agency as well, to play games to understand your medium or watch playthroughs if you're like very bad with your thumbs. Uh, and it goes the other way also for developers. I see too many video games developers who do, do not read, do not watch movie. Like, oh my God, people, please. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. We're, we're going to go into this, okay? We're definitely going to go to the executional part. But I think maybe something that can really help set, you know, maybe set the stage for like, the audience here. You guys have spoken about like, Arcane, and you've made some good other examples. Maybe, can we list some examples of transmedia adaptation that's re that worked really well to, like, you know, let's say, ex expand the lore other than Arcane? I know he's going to plug certain franchises, but, you know. Well, I hear him <laughs> at the end, but like, you know I, know, I know he's got some in mind, but like, you know, maybe the other, you know, stuff that you can plug your own stuff, you can, you know, give other examples. What are, when has transmedia adaptation worked superbly? Like chef's kiss. What, what do you mean by worked well? Do you mean met commercial success or? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Are, are, are we here? Is this a, are we here as, in, uh, you know, like uh, capitalist stakeholders? Are we here as money? Money is nice. Yeah? Money no. is nice. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to make a, tran like a transmedia adaptation, you have to have like extreme financial goals. <laughs> so, yeah, your, your question has to specify was it met with positive feedback from the audience? Did let's, we... go let's go there, let's go there, let's go there. I do. I still do, and still with Assassin's Creed, because again, that's our biggest transmedia franchise. But um, we launched two years ago, I think, at least we started, a webcomic series in China called Assassin's Creed Dynasty. Uh, we partnered up with uh, one of the biggest uh, webcomic artists at the time, Chu Chanjie, and we launched the webcomic on Tencent webcomic platform, and um, so now it's... I think we launched nearly 40 episodes and uh, we have accumulated uh, a billion and a half views uh, online. So this is huge and we can say it's a major success not only because of the figures obviously, it's great but it's not everything. Uh, it's mostly about the qualitative uh, feedback we received because this was a story crafted at a very um, important era of Chinese history, the Tang Dynasty, which has been exploited over tons of movies, series, books. So it was touchy to address that specific part of Chinese history. But we were fortunate enough to work again with a local writer who had a real craft at creating historical stories. And well, that's what made it a success, basically. Um, I think what's important is to have like your toolkit, like we discussed, the, the pillars, the character archetypes, the kind of storylines you want to explore, and then just give that toolkit to creators who are experts at what they do, who are great comic artists, who are great script writers, and let them do their magic. The responsibility, I think, for uh, franchise owners, for IP owners, is to develop the proper toolkit for these creators to just appropriate uh, the, the franchise. I think it's, great. it's a great writing problem, right? Like, like the writer's blog is like, yeah, but, but why do you wrote about Assassin's Creed in, in China? And like, oh, and then they can kind of, all that stuff kind of, kind of comes out. I think for me, like, successful ones, actually dating back quite a long, if you go to Kinokuniya or bookstores here, there's like a game literature section. And it's like Halo, it's like Assassin's Creed, it's like a bunch of this stuff has existed for a while. So there are there's definitely a you know a, a populace that does that. But I think for me it's more of the visual medium that I think perhaps I think uh, I, you know, Pokemon does pretty well because the, when Pokemon first came out, we were I was a kid and I'm still old and I'm still looking forward to playing it next month. 
but they've still managed to capture the audience from the age of like six or seven till like 40 right and they do this by having um, there are different like animation series there's one that's slightly darker there's one that's slightly the regular one and then they have different stories and like you know books and everything and but they also cater to different ages so I think the Chinese is not only like the immediate users but also as a successful IP across time this is gonna be a weird one that I'm gonna give Sonic the Hedgehog I, it, it's straight, but like, I, there's a whole... Okay, so I know the video games from when I was a kid and everything. I know the video games from like more recently. But if you look at the comic, and I hesitate to use the word adaptation because they're not adaptations. They're, they're, like we've been talking about, they're building out the lore and everything. There's a whole different, not different, but a whole wider lore in the comics of Sonic the Hedgehog that is barely touched on in any of the games. And... Like for me, when, you, when I think about transmedia adaptations, that's actually one of the first ones that comes to my mind. Where you've got people who know Sonic the Hedgehog purely from the comic books or purely from the books and know very little about the games. And you've got people who know about the games and you've got people who are obsessed with it and they know everything and they know how the games will fit into the books and everything like that. So for me, in terms of, in terms of successes in their individual mediums, Overall, probably Sonic the Hedgehog is the one. We, we grew up watching the cartoons, right? Like, oh, I, said, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, that too as well. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, but it goes to, it's a testament to how we're talking about like if like bigger film studios pick it up, and yeah. then Sonic looks like the back, the backlash. So it's like what the what? <laughs> like once again, it shows that they don't understand exactly who they're writing for. At this point, I just want to point out if if nobody else has noticed, Wayne is wearing red shoes, just like a certain hedgehog. <laughs> That wasn't intentional, I swear. <laughs> Gotta go fast. I think for me, I, I cannot quote Arcane again, but I can quote Riot, it's fine, right? I can go towards the same company. Go, go, go. Uh, it's more about like alternative formats uh, where I find interesting things as a writer and as a developer. Uh, Riot is extremely good at player story, like at managing that kind of world and alternative story, especially around the sports scene, around LOL, uh, all the music videos they do, all the community management that they do. For me, it's still a form of transmedia because they extend the world beyond the game in a way that is extremely narratively controlled. And it's amazing how tightly they manage to weave that into the story of the game itself. Like they've understood the narration that is already created by players around like streaming, basically. Uh, the kind of projection you do on the characters that are actual players, actual esports teams with their rise to fame for the adversities like you see in like general sports. You have these narratives that are usually used by journalists to like weave a story for a tournament. It's exactly the same in eSport. And you see that kind of narrative control that is brought uh, by tournaments that are usually organized by the companies that own the IPs. But Riot is extremely smart because they push that to another level by putting that kind of ecosystem into fiction. And the narrative, like the music videos for me are absolute genius. Like if you push a bit, like. Further in time, you have what Halo did, Halo 3, uh, with the RRG when, uh, like, to kickstart the game, they did uh, alternate reality game around the uh, future com like shipping of the game. Uh, that was a story built on the world of Halo 3 and in which players could act as characters. So you had that full trail of enigmas that you could um, explore that had real life anchors that was extremely interesting um, there was um, clues that you could fetch in like phone cabins hidden in the desert and one of the players became extremely famous because he faced a fucking hurricane sorry to actually go fetch that call uh, and the call was like please dude go back home I, I cannot do this right now. <laughs> I will send you an email with the text and the solution it's fine just go away and that kind of investment that is absolutely insane is usually where you can see the stories that are the most interesting to me like I love linear media but everything with like a sliver in, of interactive I find so fulfilling for the players. Like, even if it's a series with like a button to push, I will still love it. Like the everything that Netflix has done on Motor Swatch was extremely interesting because it's still 
it's in, in infancy stage, let's say, there are many things that we can criticize in the format, but it does understand that logic of media storytelling and like pushing a world a bit beyond what it can be. And it's not just like I take a full IP and I put it into a whole other different medium and it's something entirely different. No, it's taking it and making it, morphing it into something that is more. I love it. Yeah, talking about like just pressing buttons and those walking experience games, like the Stanley Parable is just awesome. You know, you just, I, just, you just walk around and follow a guy's voice and you choose not to follow and it adapts and you're like, wow, I want to watch a movie about this, but how would that work? You know? And uh, I think that would be something for the writer to figure out. My, my wonderful mentor says uh, the writer will figure something out. And we eventually do. <laughs> Closer to your mouth. Sorry? Hold, it, hold, hold the mic a bit closer. Oh, to your sorry. Mouth. Okay. All right. Okay, okay, okay. We've been talking about, okay, you guys have mentioned uh, stuff about how transmedia adaptation allows, like, you know, like these franchise stories to reach larger audiences and all that. Maybe we can go, you know, into that a bit more. What would the benefits, what are the other benefits, you know, and reasons why, you know, uh, more studios should go in this, you know, in this like, direction and attempt transmedia ad adaptations? Any, well, I think one of the major benefits is for the audience, like your fans, and that's what drives you to create transmedia content when you're a franchise owner, is just to give more content to your fans, basically. Um, more content that gives them something different. The, the goal in the end is always to enrich their experience. Again, that's what I said earlier, it, it, it gives you when you rely on a writer, on an illustrator, it gives you a specific point of view on a franchise, on a universe, and it, uh, well, then Transmedia allows you to give that diversity of perspectives on the characters to your audience. Of course, it also can serve very uh, simple purposes, such as filling the narrative gaps that you weren't able to fill in the game, a prequel on a fan favorite character, is always something interesting to create. A sequel to uh, a story that won't happen in a game is also something interesting. So for the fans, I guess that's it. Then, and that's the kind of the ultimate goal. It allows you also sometimes to reach new audiences that, that, that are not necessarily players themselves. Um, an example in our catalog at Ubisoft is uh, the audio series that we produced with uh, Audible on Tom Clancy's The Division. Um, we read a lot in the qualitative feedback that we had on that uh, audio series that people just listened to it because it was a, a Tom Clancy project, not because it was a Division project. And so we had a lot of non-players listening to that audio series. And it's great for us because um, we are not talking about games only. We are talking about universes, and we just want to bring new audiences, new fans into the universes, whatever the media. I, I, I think another one that's really important is uh, player retention. So, okay, for example, Elden Ring, right? I, I loved Elden Ring. I finished it in, in a week, and I was like, I wanted more, but there was, there was no more. I could play the game 77 more times, but I wouldn't get more. Um, but I would want to read more. I would want to absorb as much as I can, but, but at the pace that video games come out, I was like, oh, what's the next thing, right? And then you kind of lose, the companies kind of lose their focus, and it's hard to gain popularity back, because you're not launching Elden Ring 3 or 2 in anytime soon, so how are you going to get back that players at the same time? But if I constantly leak you chunks like what Riot does, like every week there's a new animation, a new mu music video, and they're pumping that stuff out. So they are always hooked, they're coming back weekly for that, that update on your, your league law and stuff like that. But when, you, when publishers don't and they just leave it, then you kind of taper off and you fall off. Uh, I just want to go back to what you were saying, Etienne. It's kind of interesting that you said that, you know, uh, transmedia adaptation allows people who don't play games to immerse themselves in this world. It was almost, we were almost thinking kind of the other way around for our book as well because I mean, it's, it's a weird little duck where it's, you know, it's prose and it's comics and it's like going in here and in there. And, you know, some people might be like, whoa, that's new. But a game is, weirdly enough, for a lot of people, like that's, that's the medium that they're most familiar with. 
So we figured that what better way to immerse people, and you were talking about like how the world itself is, is one of the strongest tenets in, in any lore itself. And we figured what better way to immerse people into the world than put them into it, have them play through the world itself, and let them get into the world itself. So yeah, I think, I think it's that, plus like what you were saying earlier on about just giving them more stories. I think it's also, and this is from a purely selfish point of view as the writer, because I think if you work in all these different mediums, it allows you to tell different kinds of stories as well. Like the book, were, the book turned out a lot more serious than I initially planned. Like it was supposed to be an all out comedy. And then, you know, it, it, it still got comedic bits in it, but it's still very serious. Whereas I think the game allowed me to lead more into the comedic side of things, just because of how ridiculous we could make it. And it's, it's the medium itself, but it's the story that the medium allowed us to tell. So I think it, it, for the creators as well, there's that wonderful chance to, you know, expand the playground, but build into the playground as well. So it's not just a sandbox, but you're building sandcastles. Your, your toolbox gets bigger. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah, the yeah. thing, right? Like, like uh, simple song of sound, yeah. you know, oh, like oh, yeah. if you're reading a book and it's like, they're describing a scary sound, it's like, all right, cool, but what if I'm deaf? I, you know? So I, I think it, 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 it's, it's, it's the toolbox that you have to play with. Yeah. It's it fun. punishes your skill like crazy also as a writer. Because in video games, you don't just have writing. You have narrative design, you have dialogue, you have content writing, and you have scenario writing. And all these are four very different fields, like extremely different. When you write in linear media, usually you do everything at once, except narrative design because it's game design, so you don't have mechanics because you don't have interactivity. But when you work in writing in video games, given the size of the team, you might have to do all four jobs yourself. It, it is insane and you should not do that, uh, but it does polish your skill in other medium because you will learn new languages and new tools that you can absolutely apply in other media. And don't forget and I, item descriptions. For sure. And I think those tools allow you also to, um, again, somehow address themes, for example, that are harder to make that strong in a video game. Um, we created an audio series uh, in which the main character is uh, blind, actually. So you definitely get to just live the experience just like the character, blindly, by just listening to the environment, etc. So Blind engine is the absolute best. <laughs> I love it. Got a question. Okay, so have you, do you guys feel that uh, maybe sometimes when you reach out to a certain audience, uh, you, you're saying some people just prefer reading books? You know, do we, are, are, you know, are there times when you get that audience and then tran uh, transfer them over, kind of like, you know, convert them over because, they, because of the love of the lore? You, I, I, even when saying, like, you know, people play games and in between releases and DLCs, they, you know, they go and read. What about, do people read and kind of go, okay, I, I kind of really like this world and, you know, I want to know more about this world. Do, they, do you see your, you know? A reverse sort of a conversion. Yeah, they're, they're definitely converts. I'm um, maybe not so much. Uh, I'm not so much about books per se. But let's take uh, League of Legends for example. Arcane came out. Everyone wanted to play Jinx, and there was a running joke. It's like, is this buy from Arcane? You know, it's like because these people don't know about it, but they want to play the game, and they play it for a week and realize that the game is super toxic, and <laughs> uh, and they're like, oh, uh, I'll just watch the show, I guess. You know, but there has been. You see, a, definitely a huge surge in Overwatch as well. Every time a new PV drops, a new character animation comes out, you see a surge in numbers again. So, um, yeah, I would say uh, there's, there's definitely a conversion from outside the game, but it's true mostly through visual media, at least for me personally. Um, um, I'm, for books, I think it's a little more, more niche, but I think definitely it can happen. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, w I would... I'm wondering, let's say... Um, I know, like, the, the Warcraft lore is heavily in, in its books. Like, um, Especially, the, you know, my favorite one's a lot of the clans about thralls growing, thrall growing up. The game got cancelled, so, you know, no way to play that game. But, like, you know, after, after reading that, I'm just, you know, I can imagine a lot of people would sort of go, okay, I want to know more about, like, this Warcraft world, you know? And there's only so, again, books can only come out, you know, so often. Do, let's say, Etienne, for example, you know, the, the, the Chinese, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese adaptations of uh, Assassin's Creed. Have, you know, does that lead to, and you know, do you see that that leads to an uptick in players? Well, it's very hard to measure, to be honest. And uh, so 
I couldn't really give you an answer to that because um, the thing with books, for example, is that when you sell them, you don't know to whom you're selling them. Only digital content can provide you data about who's reading, who's listening to what you're creating. So it's very hard to know if the people who bought your books were already player, were not player yet. What? what? No, you, don't, you don't put spyware in the spine of the books? Unfortunately not. Soon, <laughs> soon. <laughs> I'm actually kind of curious, Etienne, like when, and like, maybe the rest of you guys can answer this. Like for me, it's slightly different where when I approach the book and when I approach the game, I have the, the benefit of not thinking to myself, oh, this has to convert these readers to the game. Or this has to convert these players to the book. Like when, when creators are working on, you know, uh, uh, expansions of the law in Assassin's Creed books and everything, do they have to keep that in the back of their mind? Like, you know, if somebody new is coming into this, we want them to go to the game? Definitely not. Never. Okay. Like for me, the guiding principle in any transmedia endeavor that we have is to produce the best content possible in this specific format. And I think that's what's, what, you, what you said uh, earlier about movies. It's not like uh, you have a big Hollywood movie producer telling you, hey, I know how to make a movie. Yeah, you, you have to just craft the best possible book, for example, with an author that is expert in this craft. It's just a matter of providing him with the proper toolkit the proper ingredients. But that's what must be guiding you. For me, Transmedia, it's not an extended marketing strategy. You know, of course, retention is a, an added benefit, but it must not guide you in the creative process. I think the, the suits will always have their metrics, right? That's, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about here. But I think at the end of the day, you, you are still giving content for the players who want more. So it is still for them, and for them, they still want the best content they want to consume. It can't be, oh, we're trying to convert someone, or we tell you some basic law story that you've already heard, right? We don't want that. I had a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember, I remember now, I remember now. Okay, you guys have been like, you know, talking about like, you know, setting up pillars and, you know, finding like the best, and, you know, the best of the best in like respective mediums and all that. So in an ideal pipeline, if someone you know wants to go into this, how do they set it up? What you know? What tips? What guidelines can you give them to like not screw it up? There is no ideal pipeline. <laughs> it depends on the IP. It depends on the creator. It depends on the medium. It depends on the team. It depends on like the rights holder. It depends on the money. Mm -hmm. Like the, the money is a huge parameter <laughs> I, because I think Ubisoft has the power in terms of money, I, I do believe, uh, to afford the loss on transmedia creations. But if you have a smaller IP, usually it's not something that you can bear as a smaller time studio. So you will invest more on the processes than the people, sadly. So you will lose in creative and writing quality for sure. Uh, but you can try to have a return on investment that is more satisfying and won't cause a crash and burn. So you have that just notion, that initial notion of knowing where everyone stands, like where does the author stands, if it's a book to video games or book to something adaptation, like do they have a right to modify, to veto content? Usually that's a poor idea especially if it's not a medium they know, uh, or if they don't have a language to express what they want to say in that specific medium. I highly recommend training them in the language. Like I worked on Inua, uh, which uh, like a French indie uh, game that was originally pitched as a movie. Like it was written by two screen, like screenwriters who had never touched a game in their lives. Like looked at them from afar, Yes, this is weird and for my grandkids, okay? Uh, and they had no clue about how to tell a story in the games. For, for them, it was just cinematics. Like, just, I'm gonna put bits of movies in my game. That's how story goes, right? Uh, and you have to tell them about, no, there is story in gameplay, there is story in an action, there is story in verbs, there is story in exploration. And, and you put them in these like, kind of very simple games to kind of connect to a language they know. So I like to recommend Flower, I like to recommend Florence, I like to recommend Paper Please, Stanley Parable, if they can like stomach it. Uh, like games that are not hard, 
to finish, but have a huge impact. Like Brother's Tale of Two Sons is extremely good in terms of narrative design because you have that bond between gameplay and what's actually happening. Um, if I may spoil it, basically you have your controller, uh, it's for one player, but you control two characters. Your left hand is one character, your right hand is another. So at the start of the story, you have these two brothers that kind of don't align, don't really like know how to work together, and you're fumbling because it's the first time you're controlling two characters with two hands, and that's not too normal for most people. And the more you progress in the story, the more they have like good teamwork and that strong, very strong bond, and you become good. Your skills are nice. The level design is yeah, but it's okay. It works. And at the end of the game, towards the end, one of the characters dies, and you have one hand that is useless. Entirely useless, like on your keyboard or on your gamepad, does not do anything until the end of the game when you have this lonely, like younger brother just facing the initial challenge you saw at the first of the game. And this time you can use both hands, but you're still alone. And you feel that rush of like feeling like your big brother is there. And it's something that can only be achieved through interactivity and that kind of mastery of our ergonomy and what actual interactive gameplay through hardware or software can do. So you have to share that language with them and for the developers as well. They have to read books, they have to understand context, they have to understand subtext, they have to understand the topic of metaphor, how you bring the theme inside the thing. Yeah. I think, um for me, what I probably do in the ideal timeline, um, we already surrounded ourselves when we were building this game with people who knew what they were doing. And I'm very lucky in that sense. Um, you know, Lionfish and Imba knew exactly what they were doing. And when I was coming there going, um, can, I, can I do this? And they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Keep, keep moving, right, the boy, you're on the right track, it's okay. Um, <laughs> you know, that was great. But they also, they were also there to, to consult. They were there to, to show us what was the right way to do something, what was the best possible way that we could do it for this kind of story. I think in an ideal timeline, what I would do is something similar. I just surround myself with even more people who know what they're doing. Um, in an ideal timeline, I probably would have taken on a co-writer for this one. Um, the next game I write, I definitely want to take on a co-writer of somebody who's very experienced in games, somebody who knows. Because I'm, I'm coming from this as the writer and I'm being guided by people who are developing the game and who are, are composing the music for the game and everything. Um, and there is common enough language, but if I had another writer of me, then he could probably dumb down the language for me even more in writer speak. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's what I do. I, I'd probably get a co-writer on board. And I just keep surrounding myself with people who know exactly what they're doing. Because that is incredibly important. I'll come back to what I said earlier, but uh, in an ideal world, one thing is to just come back to the fundamentals of storytelling and have that in your toolkit. If you create a character, whether it is originated in a book to get into a video game or the other way around, create the character with his backstory, with his motivations, with his internal conflicts, with where you want him to land, at the end of the, at the end of the trip, <laughs> um, but build a world, just the fundamentals of storytelling. And probably in an ideal world, I would love for writers, whatever the media on which they write, to have in mind that when they create a story, they create a world around the story. So think also of all the background elements of that world, and if. One writer that is at the core of the project has all that in his or her mind, or rather in writing, <laughs> because it's always good to have the tools in writing. Um, just work on it. That's what any transmedia project works easily, and that's what will allow you to deliver on something that can be good. Uh, I think for me, like personally, I've heard a lot of all kind of pitch. People say that, oh, I'm, I want to create this game and we'll make it an IP. I was like, all right, stop right there. Like, what makes you think that it's going to be popular enough to warrant, uh, you know, like a TV show or something like that? Like, why? It, you don't worry about that. Like, what I didn't say was like, if it's good, people want more. And then you realize there's something good in your hands. And if they don't want it, maybe try another IP. Like, it's like the quickest way, right? It's like a, kind of like a VC way where you try 10 pictures and whichever sticks, you do it. 
and uh, I'm not sure about uh, how people are familiar are with the NFT world. They have like all these like characters, and they say, "Oh, we're going to do law, and we're going to do like stuff from there." I was like, "What law? You, you don't have you don't have story yet. You know how are you going to do it? Who is your audience? The people who bought it, but they they're, they're there for investment, right? It's different." So when people come with me saying that, oh, I want to do an IP as I, I think that's going by wrong. For me, building the world is most important. The world allows you the fantasy. So, for example, like Assassin's Creed very clearly has, you are a Viking. I'm down, you know? But when you don't have that, when someone explains this really cool story and this plex is like, oh, yeah, all right, so what's the, what, 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 where's the game? What, what's the fantasy? What do I do, you know? Uh, and then you kind of lo lose what it is. So I think a very strong fantasy combined with a very deeply created world. You don't need the stories in the world. You just need to tell me like a creation of the world, what the state is it now. Maybe for example, like Walking Dead, right? If I had a Walking Dead thing and the show was in Atlanta, Georgia, what about people in Japan? I want to see what's happening over there. You know, so, but they created a world first. Well, the world has a pandemic of flesh-eating zombies. Cool. You know, uh, I buy that. And once that fantasy is so strong, uh, it's easy to see where these things can go. I think more than the world, we could resume it as an ecosystem. You guys keep talking about worlds, you know, worlds with characters and, and, and does that mean certain genres of games or like let's say books adapt better than others? Like would Pac-Man not adapt well because it doesn't have a world? I know, I know there was the Adam Sandler movie, Excuse but let's not me, go. Excuse me, good sir. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen any intermission from the Pac-Man extended world? <laughs> there is a story, there is a world. The ghosts are actually like sheets of a people. Clyde is not a real ghost? <laughs> yes, no. Okay, but okay. Are, are, there other, you know, are there genres of games? Because, okay, you guys have mentioned so far League of Legends, um, Assassin's Creed, okay. Uh, Cyberpunk. Hmm? Cyberpunk. Walking Dead. Walking Sonic Dead. The Hedgehog. Halo. Are there... And, um, but, but like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in on something that Ian said just now where like, you know, sometimes, you know, just don't go there. Are there genres that people should know, you know, if you're, if you're trying to pitch an IP and try to build, you know, around this, maybe not, you know? I think you can, I mean, stories are everywhere and in every form. I mean, our own very lives are narratives of the events that happened to us in the past. So, you know, I think you can create stories from anything, as long as you have something that is consistent, something that relies on pillars, a tone, um, an initial event, if you're set in the real world, zombies. <laughs> um, you can build story from anything. What, what makes it successful is, it's rather that, you know, the, the, the real problem. It's not, can you do it? It's, how do you do it? And in order to perform to deliver on that. Again, work with uh, crafted writers, crafted illustrators, work with people who have that mindset of building a world out of a set of initial constraints. As long as you don't indulge in like self fantasies, I want this specific IP in this specific genre. If it's a mismatch, it's not going to be something you can force. You have to understand the IP and see what could work for it. I would say a good example is Angry Birds, right? I don't think when they made Angry Birds, it's like, there's law, guys. You know, like, I, don't, I really don't think it was like, I could be wrong. But look how it's, where it's gone, right? The game got popular. They're like, hey, put like these birds. Let's, let's make up stuff. But you already have the characters. You can build around it. So you don't necessarily need a world first, but you don't know what, what's going to explode, like Flappy Bird. I mean, I won't be surprised if there's like law for Flappy Bird at this point. But it's what people are drawn to. Maybe they're related to the struggles of trying to flap and stay afloat. You know, maybe that's their thing. Uh, but there's stories everywhere, like at the end says. So it doesn't need, the game that came out doesn't necessarily have to have a story that drove it, but it can be something like modern art that's like something that's extrapolated to me or to my own uh, uh, understanding of the world. Yeah, I think, I think genres basically, what they do is they distill down what the world is to a very simple idea. But I don't think genres should define like, oh, this particular genre works in this particular medium. Worlds are worlds. It's like what everybody else has been saying. It's if the richness of the world is what's important, not what the world looks like. You know, you can get just as much richness in a dystopian sci-fi as you could in sword and sorcery fantasy. 
you can get just as much richness in, like you were saying, like everyday life. You know, a slight twist on everyday life, that's a world in and of itself. I think genres themselves are good to kind of get a quick idea about it, but they don't define what the world themselves can be. And actually, I think transmedia allows you to navigate across genres too. Uh, again, what we did with the rabbits, it's comedic creatures, basically, but we built uh, an adventure shonen in a medieval fantasy world. So, you know, that's also something that... Transmedia is also kind of a lab to experiment things around genres, around audiences. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you guys one more question before we open up like, the floor to the audience, okay? As new mediums rise, let's say like video games, for example, other mediums sometimes fall and, and for popularity, okay? This might be the dumbest question asked in this entire convention, but I'm going to be the one asking it, okay? Is transmedia adaptation a way to ensure your story's survivability? Is it something along the lines of fish developing lungs and legs? I think it's more an evolution based on not survivability because I'm afraid that my medium is going to die, but I want it to have more retention. No, 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 not, about, no, not, not your medium might die, but your story. So if your story exists across several mediums, then... Yes, but as in you being afraid that it would like fade away if the medium it's based on would disappear. If your story existed only in one medium and that yep. medium faded, your story fades with it, right? But if, you, if your story exists in several mediums... I disagree with the, if the medium fades, the story fades as well. Because, for instance, interactive fiction is something that is kind of on the down low. Uh, it's not as big as it was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but stories that have been told in that medium are still alive in terms of lore and the way players make it live. So it's more a way of extending the life of an IP rather than preventing it from dying. We have a huge issue in video games of like, safekeeping of IPs, especially like in retro platforms. And that is an immense problem that is very specific to video games because we do have works of museums on every single other medium. Video games are still a bit near uh, and we are losing licenses every day and that's terrifying but it's not a problem of the medium itself it's more because we are extremely technologically dependent mm -hmm. so that's it's not about the loss of the story mode about of the loss of the technology i think yeah i think it's it's not so much the preservation of your story i think it's the preservation of your stories so it's it, it's like what it's like what Simo was saying where it's you're, you're preserving the worlds by, by taking them from, say, books and then, you know, bringing them into, in, uh, into video games or from video games into books, into movies or whatever it is. And, you know, ideally, all of these are different stories. You're not doing, you're not trying to do a direct adaptation of a book into a video game because what works in a book might not necessarily work in a video game. What works in a video game might not necessarily work in a book. You're telling different stories and I think... I mean, we keep going back to the words lore and worlds, but I think that's what transmedia is. It's not so much the preservation, I guess, but the expansion of those worlds, of that lore. And yeah, I think that's what it is. More the stories than any one particular story. But I think if preservation is your goal, then you're going in the wrong direction. Because again, as I said earlier, what you want to do is just create content that is meaningful, create content that is good, per se, that has an interest. So it's not a matter of just expanding and preserving your brand. It's a matter of uh, bringing value you know, in, the, in the media that you are exploring at the moment. So that should be the utmost goal in transmedia creation. Just bring value to that media. I'm going to go on a bit of a philosophical tangent here on like an additional kind of a transmedia thing. For me, when, when, when we tell stories, all writers subliminally have a message that they want to share, right? For me, it's like stuff, you're not alone or stuff like that. And your stories are not, you die twice, right? Once when you die and once when they, your, your, last, your, name, your name is last spoken. So when you write something that affects someone emotionally, like you, you wrote a story about a, a family and you know, someone really felt that, and they take that with you, 
you know, whatever they choose to do in art or life or whatever, that part is now imparted to them, right? So is that trust media? Maybe, arguably, because you are exposing that everything is a narrative, as we said before, and you've taken that experience and you're bringing it forward. My legacy is not dead. Um, so that's how I would say that. But I, was, I also, to answer it more, you know, in the context of what we're talking about, I don't think, uh, like, like you said, I think we do it for the now. I, I think the Bible's been around. It's not fading away, you know, as a medium. So I think um, for us, I don't think we have to worry that much about it. I therefore lay claim, this was the dumbest question, this convention. <laughs> well done. Yes. <laughs> All right, my claim to fame. Okay, um, audience, anyone got some questions for these fine storytellers over here? Uh, uh, thank you for taking the question. Uh, I've written the question down just a minute. Sorry, I, I think you need to speak up a little. Yeah, um, I have a question about adapting stories from one medium to another. Are stories made in a certain medium easier to be transferred to other, adapted to other mediums? Uh, such as, for example, there's a huge misconception maybe. Uh, is adapting movie uh, stories from movies to games easier than adapting games to movies? Or is it irrelevant? The original medium is it relevant to the story, to, to transferring the movie story? Well, there's not an absolute answer to that, I think. It's never easy anyway. Um, and I, don't, I really don't want to repeat myself again and again, but it's, it's not a matter of how geared up you are for that. Did you have in mind that uh, in your initial media, you were creating a world that would then be brought onto another media or not, that's what will make it easy. And uh, I guess that's why some adaptations are not that successful. I think sometimes also you, sometimes you watch a movie and you go like, this would make a really good game. Or you play a game or something like, this would make a really good movie. So I think it, it really depends on the nature of, of what it is. It was a dumb answer, I guess, but like, that's how I feel. And also, uh, I think the collaboration between the teams working on one and the other media is key, key to that because no one knows the initial media better than those who write it. So you really need to be able in your whole creative development process to bring these teams together so that they can share information, feedback, and at the same time to make sure that each of these teams you know, remains in his own set of skills. You don't want, sorry guys, narrative, video game narrative writers to script write a movie. Different set of skills, so. Depends on your cultural language as well. Like, for instance, you just said, this would be a good movie or this would be a good game. It's not something that you can muster an instinct for if you're not learned in these ways. So it, some games will never be a good movie by these specific people. Some movies will never be a good game by these specific people, and the other way around. Anybody else have a question? Hey everyone, <laughs> thanks so much for the fantastic panel. Okay, so my question is about like, um, when I know some of you mentioned you try to discourage direct adaptations of stories into other mediums, right? Um, how do you balance appealing to the purists of the original lore versus appealing to modern audiences? So for example, um, Tolkien and Rings of Power, for example, there's like a lot of like discourse around that, you know, about gender representation, ethnicity representation, and even themes of like, oh, instead of the hero's journey, now we look at a more gray area of antagonist versus um, straight protagonist and antagonist relationship. So how do you balance losing, oh, sorry, retaining the purest audience as well as attracting new audiences? I think we had a very interesting conversation about this earlier. I can't remember what IP we were talking about. But it was basically, who, who do we appeal to? Do you appeal to um, the fanboys who've played Warhammer for 20 years? Uh, or do you want to get new people into the thing? And I think that largely depends on, I guess, the company's stance or what they want to do with it, right? If it's like inclusion and stuff. And there's a lot of backlash with Rings of Power. With like, it's fantasy. Why can't we have black dwarves and, and stuff? That is, uh, 
And the purists uh, will remain that way. They are a set number, but the, you can get infinitely more by reaching out, uh, especially in this generation. So I would say, I, in this case, the Rings of Power, I think casting their net wider because they're going to make more of these shows is what they'll do. Um, but but we also, like, I think we also talked about like when you create like transmedia stuff like Assassin's Creed stuff, you're creating the best content for the people who love it and want to consume it. So I don't think there's a clear-cut answer of who you really pander to, but it really depends on the intent. The holy grail, of course, is to appeal to both audience, you know, fans and newcomers. But to be successful, I think, is to stick with the pillars of your franchise at first. When you take the rings of power, well, the pillars, I mean, the skin color of the characters, definitely not a pillar in a Tolkien universe, you know? So whatever, there will always be a very vocal minority criticizing what you do anyway. So also something that is important when you are developing content over years and releasing it over years, you get lots of feedback. Well, don't listen too much to the vocal majority. Rather pay attention to what the silent minority is not expressing by words, but just by buying what you create. So yeah. I tag on to that. So you know, having worked on a couple of Assassin's Creed, you look at Reddit, and they were going, this is not one Assassin's Creed we used to play, and it still sold very well. So, <laughs> back then. Yeah, I think just to, to repeat what Etienne has been saying, and <laughs> because you've been repeating it so many times, you poor, poor man. Um, no, but like, it's, it's exactly like what he was saying, where it's, the story is the most important thing. I, I, it might be different from, for other writers, I'm not sure, but I can't think about, you know, if let's say I was working on like, you know, a, a massive project or anything, I can't think about what every single fan is going to say about what I write, because that would just cripple me. Um, you know, I, what you want to do is you want to tell the best possible story. You're probably not going to get some new fans. You probably might not get some of the fanboys or some of the purists. But if your story is good, then it's going to touch somebody. If your story is good, it's going to affect somebody. And I think that's the main goal. When you get down to it, when you're telling these stories, it, whatever medium you're telling them, what you want to do is get that emotional response from your audience, from your players, from your readers. I think that's more important than trying to figure out the demographics specifically. Basically, you have three types of transmedia adaptation. You have A to A, B to B. It's basically, I take the original material and I do the exact same carbon copy, like The Last of Us, for instance, the series that is coming is like carbon copy. Uh, that is going to attract mostly the core audience and is a way to extend it. Like, I want you to discover something that is in the game that I assume you won't be discovering because you won't be playing the game. Then you have extended ecosystems that are, like, based on what we've said so far, the best kinds, because you're using storytelling tools that didn't exist in the original IP. And it's the, the entire point to tell something different with new tools, because if you try to adapt a video game strictly into a movie, you're going to lose stuff, because there were things that were told by the mechanics. And if you try to say, to tell the same movie, like the same story, you can't, because you don't have these tools anymore. And then you have the, the, the bad, which is basically Avatar, the last time brother, <laughs> who take the series and you make a bad movie because you didn't understand what was working originally in the initial material. Avatar is extremely hard to adapt because it is perfect in its own storytelling mastery. And the movie was the, what that is that a movie really or is that like what are you talking about? a statement no movie. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about it i don't want to talk about it sorry <laughs> you can talk about the other avatar movie avatar 2 coming out in december please watch it in the cinemas and in like on the 28th there is the thing at gardens bay also yeah that too <laughs> it's gonna be amazing but that's my day job <laughs> Anyway. Um, the gentleman behind Gwen, you had a, you had a question too? Hello, well, it's a great talk, nice panel. Uh, I just had a question because every time I think of transmedia, I think sorry, of Nintendo. Uh, sorry, we, we um, cannot you speak up a little bit, please? You can't hear me? There you go. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks for the panel, it was a great discussion. Um, I just, every time I think of transmedia, I wanted to know your opinion on what I consider and put the the major transmedia IPs of right now. 
the Marvel DC universes and Nintendo's Pokemon. Um, do you consider them transmedia adaptation or successful transmedia IPs? Or do you think they've missed a boat somewhere? Would you like to work on them, for example? <laughs> Just a so, Ma what, did you say Marvel and something else? Marvel and DC Universe, uh -huh. and then the Pokemon. Yeah. Nintendo, basically all Nintendos. Uh huh. And sorry, I couldn't hear the last bit of the question. Oh, I was just curious: is do you consider them to be transmedia successfully adapted uh, universes? Oh, I, I personally would. I think so because even though they're still in games or still in movies, I think but they're they going to different target target audiences, right? Like the new Marvel Snap game came out. You know, that that's for a group of people who play card games and you know, it's, it's still a nice you know big pie of them. But I, I still think that because they're doing all these movies and having these high profile Hollywood actors and everything in it. They are appealing to different audiences within within the, the, the ecosystem in within the same medium. And I think that still is to me at least it's still transmedia. Yeah. Can I can I take this one? I, I, I think it's really interesting because like um he singled out you said DC, right? Like you said DC or Marvel? Marvel and DC. Marvel Both, and DC. Right. But like DC like from comics, it went to Injustice, the, the games. And in, from Injustice, the story, the solid story in Injustice, then went back to a comic series based on the game, right? which kind of, is that cyclical? It's a healthy yeah, cycle. Mm -hmm. Like you, when you discover new uh, storytelling means in set ecosystems, you will discover like new things that just users like and that you can refund for an even more extended ecosystem. And that's very healthy and so hard to do. And they are, I mean, they have drones that are strong enough to do things very surprising sometimes too. You've probably seen the webtoon they did about uh, the Wayne family, which is completely like a slice of life comedy. Not really your typical Batman story. Well, it's... It is so good, I love yeah, it. It's, it's, it's very funny. It's so nice. And like, well, maybe they are not specifically DC, they are not maybe the best at managing like an extended universe like Marvel, for example. Lots of... Uh, they are not so much into low consistency, they are really into diversification of uh, storytelling means, and uh, that's, that's quite successful, I think. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's transmedia, but it's a slightly different version of transmedia where it's not building out this one particular lore. Like the lore of, say, the MCU and the lore of the comics are very similar, and tonally they might impact each other, thematically they might impact each other, but they're kind of their own separate thing while kind of complementing each other. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's transmedia, but just a slightly different version of transmedia in a sense. I mean, they have their own multiverse thing, right? There's yeah, like, exactly. Even then, there's like more versions that appeal to more different people, right? Yeah. So again, yeah. It clearly think, started as something that was for the fans and then expanded to a new audience that is the Marvel and DC movie goers yeah. and the Marvel and DC ga video games player, even though Marvel is a bit more reduced and like the Batman series really has had a lasting impact in the industry. Uh, we have an audience that is the people who go see each new Marvel movie because it's just what we do now. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. is a thing. It, is a thing. <laughs> it started as something for the geeks, for the nerds, for the comic books and try to revive a bit like that kind of streak of very failed movies that happened before. Uh, and then it became like the new standard for Hollywood blockbusters. And to come back to the question that the lady before you was asking, that also helps on some topics such as uh, representation. Yeah. Uh, another webtoon uh, what, that was launched recently is uh, Vixen, where there's lots of queer characters, which was definitely not the case in the original comics. So addressing new media is also a way to address new audiences. Nostalgia is such a powerful tool, right? Like, I may not have the time to play video games anymore, but I'll listen to podcasts about Pokemon now in the club driving. You know, so that, that, yeah. It's not just a new medium, it's also a renewal. And with renewal, it's not just I'm taking this, this, this IP and it's a new story and new story tools. It's also I'm making this today with new overviews on the stories of the past. This is something that is very, very important and allows also for more, like, not just inclusion, but accessibility, because you will see more people, more audience feeling themselves represented. Like the Black Panther phenomenon was insane and so good. Well, amen to that. <laughs> I think we can squeeze in one more super short question, if anyone has one. Why 
What about something that's controversial like The Boys? Co something as controversial as The Boys. I think. Is that what, what is it? Yeah. What do you mean? Is that acceptable or? Uh, it depends on your like point of view of it. Audience-wise, I think it's not something that you can just judge as acceptable or not as a production. Like as a dev, I enjoy the tools that I used. As a consumer, I dislike it very much. Yeah. You have to be aware of the difference when you're a developer or a writer or anything. Like your personal taste and your professional taste are two very different things. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for your attention. I hope you guys enjoyed and learned lots and lots and lots today. Um, thank you, all the speakers, for sharing your wisdom. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks. So, um, if anyone has any further questions, we'll be like, you know, we'll be hurting these like really smart people over here over that area, and you can go and approach them and ask any other questions that you don't want to ask into a mic and broadcast out loud. So ask them all like the really nasty stuff. Wow. Oh.